Hey, thank you, Netta. Good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you for joining us today in the heart of the holiday season. Uh, as, as Netta mentioned on the call today, we've got Pad, Andy, Steve, and myself, but we're also fortunate to have Professor Inyong Ui from the Duke NUS Medical School with us. Uh, he's an esteemed expert in vaccines, and we look forward to hearing from him later on the call today. Uh, 2020 has uh, definitely been a memorable year for all of us, and that's probably an understatement. Uh, messenger RNA science, uh, technology, therapeutics, and vaccines are coming of age. We're definitely pleased to see the successes of the mRNA community this year and look forward to more successes and breakthroughs in 2021. Today, we're going to be uh, uh, providing an update. Um, and I'm just looking at the screen to make sure we're following the same slide as the webcast. It looks like it's loaded. Um, uh, today, we'll be providing an update on the continued progress in the development of ARCT021. That's our vaccine candidate targeting SARS-CoV-2 infection in COVID-19. ARCT021 is a unique vaccine. It utilizes self-transcribing and replicating messenger RNA, or STAR, as our tra trademark for the STAR mRNA, as well as our lipid-mediated nanoparticle, or lunar, delivery technology. Uh, we believe the science underlying ARCT021 may provide meaningful advantages compared to other COVID-19 vaccine approaches. We're pleased to announce today that we've obtained uh, approval uh, of the Singapore Health Sciences Authority to advance ARCT021 to a phase two clinical study in up to 600 subjects. This study is supported by a comprehensive clinical and scientific data set that includes our phase one slash two study results, as well as extensive preclinical studies. Uh, we plan to provide you with a detailed review of new and updated clinical and preclinical data on today's call. Uh, together, the comprehensive data generated suggests that ARCT021 may result in a highly effective vaccine with a differentiated product profile. As a self-amplifying mRNA vaccine, ARCT021 has been designed to result in substantial immunogenicity, even when administered at relatively low doses. Importantly, we believe that ARCT021 may be effective when administered as a single dose or administration. Such a profile would provide obvious and important logistical advantages compared to the COVID-19 vaccines that are beginning to be used in various countries. Indeed, in many areas of the world, the use of vaccines requiring multiple administrations will be impractical. We expect that the low doses evaluated with ARCT021 may provide additional advantages. We believe that uh, the lower dose level may result in an improved tolerability profile. Also, the requirement for lower doses is expected to increase our ability to contribute to the massive scale of vaccines required across the globe in 2021 and beyond. Based on the data we have obtained <clears throat> with ARCT021, we expect to start our phase two study soon. Uh, we've also submitted an IND to the US FDA and uh, pending IND clearance, we expect to begin activating US uh, clinical sites early in 2021. Our expectation is that we will obtain uh, interim phase two study immunogenicity data in early 2021. These data are anticipated to enable the selection of a final dose and dose regimen for uh, an ARCT021 phase three registrational study and we expect to begin uh, phase three enrollment in the second quarter. Uh, until our human phase three efficacy study data is in hand, what we do is we employ animal viral challenge studies to help us predict outcomes and to help us understand the probability of success. And I'm happy to report, uh, I'm, I'm happy to report that a single administration of ARCT021 has now been proven to be significantly effective in three separate challenge studies involving mice and now primates, as shown on this slide, number four. We've previously reported success in a fatal challenge model in mice engineered with ACE2 receptors in their lungs, and these mice are very sensitive to SARS-CoV-2 infection, so much so that, they're, that the entire control group dies within days after exposure to the virus but in the vaccinated arm, they were all robustly protected 
with ARCTO21 vaccination. Here on this slide, we summarize new primate challenge model data that was included in today's press release. Uh, this primate challenge study was sponsored by the NIH NIAID at Patel Labs in Ohio. The lead NIH principal investigators were Dr. Larry Wolframe and Dr. Janet Lathy, and we thank them for their contribution. As you can clearly uh, see, ARCTO21 vaccination is effective in this macaque challenge model. Both single administration and prime boost regimens are significantly effective in this model. Vaccinated macaques show substantial reduction in lung viral titers. This preliminary data shows that lung viral titers are between 3.3 and 3.81 log units lower in vaccinated primates in both single dose and prime boost groups, respectively. One week after SARS-CoV-2 virus challenge, geometric mean titers exceeded 1.3 times 10 to the fourth in non-vaccinated primates compared to the geometric mean titers of less than 10 in those vaccinated with ARCTO21. We also announced uh, uh, that ARCTO21 vaccination is protective in now a third animal model in immunodeficient animals depleted of B cells, which, uh, you know, and this suggests that cellular immunity, specifically CD8 T cells, plays a critical role in preventing SARS-CoV-2 infection. Protocol for a phase two study to be conducted in Singapore and the United States. This has been approved in Singapore and we are awaiting IND allowance in the USA. This study will enroll 600 older and younger healthy adult participants, with 50% of participants 55 years and older, and 25% of participants older than 65 years. In this study, we will test three different dose schedules for ARCT-021, a 7.5 microgram single dose regimen, a 7.5 microgram two dose regimen, and five microgram two dose regimen. All of these will be uh, tested against placebo. The principal goal of the study is to select a dose for our phase three registration study, and we are conducting two early interim analyses to allow for phase three dose selection at the earliest opportunity. The phase three study will enroll at least 15,000 participants, and we are targeting a study start in the second quarter of 2021. An interim analysis of the phase three study is planned to allow an application for emergency use authorization in the United States and condition approval in Europe in the second half of 2021. Our first question comes from the line of Yasmin Rahim with Piper Sandler. Please do with your question. Hi team, thank you so much for an excellent presentation and, um, and a lot of details. Um, first question is to the team, um, maybe what could be helpful for us is, can you help us, how does your single dose vaccine compared to Moderna's and BioNTech's immunogenicity data. If you could walk us through and just provide us color why the single shot is this as viable as the other mRNA technologies that have been already approved. And then I have a few follow-ups. Sure, I can, I can start there. Uh, you know, Professor Uwe already um, highlighted the, the, you know, the successful uh, uh, efficacy data that's been shared by Pfizer and Moderna and other mRNA vaccines. And, and you see that very early in the process that they you see a, a, a clear efficacy. And at those data points, uh, based upon the data that's been shared by the other mRNA, after a single administration, uh, there's low to very low uh, neutralizing antibody titers, even though they're seeing uh, uh, significant success early in the process and the time course. Uh, you asked how we compare, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the scientific community uh, compares ours to others. Uh, some people will say equivalent, some may be, uh, suggest that our single administration is, uh, shows superior uh, in immunogenicity profile uh, after a single administration. But, but clearly, uh, uh, the challenge models, uh, you know, there's proof in the pudding that in multiple challenge models in mice and in primates and and even in animals that are severely deficient in, 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 uh, in, in immune responses and, and the ability to create neutralizing antibody titers, we, we've seen success in all of these models. So uh, I, I think that there's uh, a 
reasonable sense of optimism that our single administration could be efficacious uh, based on the data we've collected. Uh, and uh, definitely, uh, to, to, to in, in a nutshell, to address your question specifically, yes, I personally believe that uh, after uh, our single administration data is significant and um, and uh, comparatively so as well. Um, thank you, Joe. Maybe the second question is: Thank you for the impressive preclinical data showing that T cell response drives protection. So do we have any other evidence on time curves for infected patients when T-cell response kicks in versus neutralizing titers? I know you shared with us the two patients, but if you could elaborate beyond that, I think that preclinical data was very compelling. But if you could share anything else that could be helpful for us, why neutralizing titers do not drive efficacy beyond what, what you shared just recently with us on the call? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, professor, you want to address that? Yeah. I can take that, yeah. Thanks very much. It's a great question. Um, I think the, the short answer is, you know, I mean, we're still learning a lot about this uh, disease, but, um, you know, the, uh, at least the clinical trials provide a, a clearer window. I mean, obviously, the immune response in a um, naturally infected um, COVID-19 patient is very much influenced by the virus itself. And we know that this virus suppresses the interferon response as, 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 uh, early on, as, especially in those who develop severe disease. There's also recent papers that's showing that those who develop disease mount a very, uh, they have they eventually develop very high titer antibodies, but it comes that appears later than those with milder disease. So the virus actually modulates a lot of the, that response. Um, but at least uh, I think in terms of the timing in which the uh, protection appears to be uh, to have effect could be mediated by antibodies triggering other immune processes, including um, you know SC receptor mediated phagocytosis or complement activation or uh, antibody dependent cellular uh, cytotoxicity or ABCC. Um, so if all these uh, uh, more um, global effects of um, uh, antibody mediated protection have not been properly assessed. We all, we've always just relied on measuring neutralizing antibodies. So, so that that's one possibility that actually binding antibodies alone may be good enough. But I think the other the emerging set of data is, that's really exciting is the T cell response uh, to uh, SARS coronavirus two, uh, and then there's a lot of um, uh, data now that's still emerging that suggests that actually those with some level of cross-reactive uh, T cells that may, could have developed against other coronaviruses seem to be able to protect against severe COVID-19. Um, so I think there's still a lot to learn, uh, and you know we are just uh, one year on from the time when we first recognized that there's such a new disease that's just emerged. So. Um, yeah, we're still operating with uh, some uncertainty, but I think the the phase three data gives us a lot of hope that you know what we're seeing is going to be useful. Um, thank you. And one last question: um, Has your IND been accepted? Can you start dosing your phase in phase two in here in the U.S. And then remind us why are you doing a phase two instead of just jumping into a phase three? And thank you for taking my question. Hey, Steve, do you want to take the first part of that? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we, we submitted our, our IND right at the beginning of the month. And so, as you know, FDA have a 30-day statutory period to review INDs. So they've actually got right up to the end of the month before they need to respond to us. But also, FDA have been a little bit distracted with uh, Pfizer and Moderna uh, emergency use applications. So, um, um, so we're anticipating hearing from them, from them any day now. Um, in terms of the phase two followed by phase three, rather than just jumping into phase three, we'd initially actually planned a phase two three study, which was a, a seamless study design. But um, in terms of the, the timing of us submitting that application, which we we would have been doing instead of the phase two application, um, it, it was falling right in flat bang in the middle of, um, of the emergency use authorization applications. And 
we, we had feedback from regulatory consultants and also from other sources that the, there's, there was at least a reasonable probability that the um, guidance around the design of phase three studies may actually change in the United States and possibly in Europe as well. And um, we really saw some risk there in terms of getting hung up with, with a study design that, that wasn't going to um, with with whatever new whatever new designs came out, for instance, what to do with subjects that are um, on the placebo arm of the subject of the study when vaccines start to become available in the country where you're trying to conduct the study, that hasn't been fully resolved yet. But I'm sure that it is going to get resolved in terms of guidance very quickly, and um, and we would need to have those kind of things baked into a phase three protocol. So when we looked at it, we decided to uncouple the phase two from the phase three. We looked very carefully at the timeline as well, and actually uncoupling the two studies, we didn't lose any time. Uh, and so the, the approach with the lowest risk, really, from a regulatory perspective, was to uncouple phase two from phase three, go straight in with the phase two study, which is going to be unaffected by any changes to the phase three recommendations, while we continue negotiations with FDA, with the European regulators, the Singapore regulators, and the other regulators about the fine points of a phase three study design in the post uh, COVID vaccine world. Does that answer your question? Yes, I, I would just add. Yeah, I would just, yeah, I would just add that by, by bifurcating the phase two and three, we can also, uh, you know, it allows our tourists to evaluate our lyophilized version of our vaccine in the phase three trial, uh, simply and cleanly, and so that's a, that brings another benefit by uncoupling them. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Gina Wang with Barclays. Please see with your question. Thank you for taking my questions. I have a few regarding the data. First is uh, regarding the fine boost data. Uh, just wondering why, you know, after boost, we did not see similar level of a uh, magnitude. Uh, if we look at the Moderna data, it's on more than 20 fold increase in terms of neutralizing antibody. And here we uh, did not see that much uh, increase after boost, and actually, over time, you know, that basically uh, decreased over time. Uh, I think it's a five microgram a cohort, almost the same as a 2019. Right. Uh, now, the professor referred to that a little bit in his presentation. I think it'd be best to elaborate further. Yes, thanks. So I suspect that that's a great question. Thanks very much. And I suspect that the reason why there's not much um, change in the antibody type there was again because of the T cell response. So uh, as, as uh, you can see from uh, Steve's presentation, that we uh, we got good um, uh, T cell response against um, uh, the antigen. Uh, and I suspect that because the when you give that in the second dose, the clearance of the um, cells transfected with the mRNA by the CD8 um, T cells may be too so rapid that it's not sufficient uh, to uh, provide a boost to the antibody. So, however, but that that I think is a good thing because as you can see from the uh, uh, MMR uh, revaccination data, uh, that actually that provides solid protection against infection uh, more so than just antibodies alone. So, uh, I mean, related to this question, you know, the, uh, as a, we do have like how many patients have close to 100,000 patients dosed, and we saw clear, you know, the uh, uh, you know, prime boost uh, activity and neutralizing antibody clearly correlated with the clinical benefit. If we look at the AstraZeneca, you have a one time convalescent serum, we saw 60%. Uh, you know, effective rate as well. The other two, two very high, and I think it's unfair to look at their first, you know, after prime, uh, because you know the four times of convalescent serum after boost that, that certainly uh, we don't know how much actually that play a role to maintain that protection over time, um, you know, throughout the clinical follow up. So you know, with the potentially you know the the small number of uh, uh, anecdotal cases that are supporting T cell versus we have a much larger amount of data showing neutralizing antibody does you know protect patients from or subjects from a viral infection. 
to how can we, you know, think and rethink about, you know, this data set compared to the competitive data. I don't think that we can conclude from the trial that the antibodies protected against COVID-19 because the, you know, the corridor of protection has been defined in the, the title of antibodies that are needed for at least um, uh, protection hasn't been defined. I mean, they all develop antibodies, which is, which is good, but whether that actually protects has not been defined. Um, so, uh, so I would, I would uh, disagree with what you just said. Having said that, you know, the, the, both um, if you look at the data that's been published so far from all these uh, uh, front runners, uh, they do not, uh, as, at least from the two mRNA vaccines, they, they only measure T cells at A29. They don't measure it any any earlier. So again, it's hard to compare between our study and theirs um, in terms of how, the level of T cells and what we can expect. Um, so, uh, of course. Given the, the lack of positive protection, then we have to infer a few things, draw a few lessons from other studies, which is what we're doing now. But I, I don't think that there is enough data to suggest that neutralizing antibodies are the ones that actually protect against infection. Okay, uh, thank you. My one uh, last question is regarding the single dose. Um, just wondering, what is the longer follow-up, uh, the pre-50 numbers for both 7.5 microgram and a 5 microgram. Yeah, Steve, you can address that. Sure. sure. Yeah, so within the um, within the phase one, two clinical trial, the single dose cohorts were followed up for uh, 57 days in that study, and then they roll over into an open label extension study where they'll continue to be followed up for a year. So the, the first of those single dose patients are about uh, within the next few weeks have their first visit in that open label extension. So we have data out to uh, 56 days after their initial injection. That was part of this uh, interim analysis. And then we'll continue to collect data on those participants as they go into the open label extension. Thank you. Here are questions. So a couple of housekeeping ones and a couple of questions for Dr. Rui. So housekeeping questions. So first, were the neutralizing antibody titers from convalescent sera run in parallel with the vaccine samples? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, sorry. Okay. Great, that's fine. Second, um, what were the binding ITG levels from convalescent sera? Uh, that's a great question. I think it's... Uh... Uh, comparable to high, slightly higher, uh, depending on severity of disease, to to the, the, okay. the uh, well vaccinated uh, subjects. Okay. Cool. So then, productively, two questions. So about this idea related to the T cell activation being what's protective here. So, to the best of your ability, can you explain biochemically why like, different messenger RNA vaccines, be it our Turris versus Moderna or Pfizer BioNTech, why they might have divergent effects on T cells as compared to antibodies? That, that's a great question. Um, I think so, I'll answer this in, in several parts. One is that it's difficult to compare um, between studies because everyone uses slightly different methods and then the, of course the antibody they use to stay in the cells are also slightly different. It would be great to centralize all of these so that we have comparable data at some point. Um, but you know, there's some caveats here that you know, we have to be a little bit careful about reading too much into data because the methods are slightly different. Uh, that's one. Two, two is that, um, uh, and, and you know, maybe Alex can uh, answer this from my own uh, perspective. I mean, I, I got very excited. Uh, about this vaccine, or at least to collaborate with Arcturus on developing self-replicating uh, RNA vaccine, uh, because we've been studying yellow fever vaccine for a while now. Um, and one of the drivers of good immune response, uh, and you know, yellow fever, is, uh, as you may know, is uh, arguably one of the best vaccines in the world because a single shot gives you, you know, 10 years or more protection. And, and we've been trying to figure out why this vaccine has been so good. And what, what we've found is that one of the 
key drivers of a good immune response is the is how long the infection lasts. So, in in a cohort of uh, about uh, over a hundred people now that we have received the vaccine and we track what happens in their blood in the first week after they receive the vaccine, uh, and then correlate this to the eventual immune response that they develop. Those who have a longer infection have got a, a better uh, immune response, which is not surprising because. Uh, the longer the antigens get presented to the uh, immune response, then the better the affinity maturation. Uh, so so I, I think one reason why um, we are getting such uh, good um, cellular immunity uh, is because of the self-replicating uh, mRNA construct uh, that presents the antigen over a longer period for the cell, uh, T cell, and therefore we get a more robust response that you know, as, as uh, one of the questions uh, you asked, why the boost is a little bit modest. And I think it's because, you know, there's a chance that this could be a single dose vaccine. Okay, so following from that, Dr. Lee, why would that be specific to cellular immunity, T cell activation, relative to um, B cell activation? Like, why would we be kind of chronically pumping out higher and higher doses of antibodies? in track with the kind of T cell induction that happens in a self-replicating um, RNA construct? Mm. Uh, great question again. I, 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 we're still trying to work out, you know, the, the, what happens in all that. Obviously, the, this will be, those fields will require a bit more experiments, but I suspect that it's part of the safety profile that um, Steve Hughes presented in our phase one data where you get, it, when we measured both CD4 and TD8 T cells, you see a lot more interferon gamma secreting cells than IL-4. And as you know, IL-4 is needed to produce, uh, drive the B cell response. So I think because of this, you know, the past um, association between the higher IL-4 compared to interferon gamma and the, event, the de development of uh, immune enhanced disease eventually in the vaccinated uh, uh, animals for SARS and MERS and in uh, children for respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, you know, the, the, we, we, I think the field and the regulators prefer to see a TH1 skew, in, in other words, high interferon gamma response than IL-4 as a safety readout. Um, so given that kind of uh, cytokine profile, perhaps that's the reason why we are stimulating a lot more cellular immunity than uh, antibody uh, uh, development. Okay, great. Thanks for taking my question. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. And ladies and gentlemen, okay, speak Okay, please. Um, so I was, I just want, just, just wanted to add this one thing, which is fundamentally the mechanism of the replicon is different to the traditional mRNAs. So, you know, we're putting in a, a construct which is self-replicating and part of that self-replication process drives a, a double-stranded mRNA intermediate before we read off the, the spike protein. And that double-stranded intermediate drives an interferon response as well. So the, you know, fundamentally we've got, we've got a different chemistry or different biology going on inside the cell um, and outside the cell than you see with a, with a conventional mRNA vaccine. 